Hey, 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 hey. What's up? What's up? From, from the front seat today, we're going to be crushing it. I got a very special guest for you today. Welcome to the show. Yes, yes, yes. You know why we feel it all good. We got a new one in there, y'all. So we're going to throw up the one right here, like Boosie Collins said, to bring it in right. My special guest today will be none other than the great actress, activist, musician, writer, and all that good stuff rolled into one. Miss Nancy Marie, I'm going to bring her on in a minute. But I need you guys to understand something. Wear your mask. Use your hand sanitizer. Stay safe. Make sure you love yourself and love your family. Our mantra for this show is always peace, love, and harmony. So I need everybody right now, if you're at home, put your hands together like this. Come on, clap them hands. Clap them hands, y'all. Yeah, yeah. Like this. Yeah, yeah. You know what? I always need this before I get started. See what I'm saying? Nothing but the funk right here, y'all. This is what makes the front seat funky and energized. Loving me some monsters. Oh, yeah. Nothing but the funk, nothing but the funk, because monster is the funk. Nothing but the funk, nothing but the funk, because monster is the funk. Yeah, it's the funkiest drink, y'all. You feel me? Right now, without further ado, I'm going to bring in my guest for you, Miss Nancy Marie. Hello. What's up? How you doing? How you doing? I'm good. What's up? I'm chilling. I'm chilling over here, just getting it together, and can't wait to have this beautiful conversation. Um, you know, yes, just bringing it in a little bit different. Hope you welcome to the new format. So you're, um, you know, going to be a part of this in a big way. Um, how are you guys yeah. doing? And uh, how is how's Philadelphia? Philly is on chill right now. Um, we're good. Um, you know, doing the best that we can with what we got. It's it's been a crazy year, but we're yeah. still here. And we're gonna make it do what it do. Exactly right. And I told you off air earlier, you're and I see you got another beautiful shirt on. We're gonna get into that in a minute. <laughs> That's what's up. Uh, but you got so many likes for that. Good trouble, that purple you was rocking that day. Yeah. Um, you know, along with so many other beautiful women. Um, and that, I was like, wow, you know, they they they, they looking at this, they don't care about me or the show. They, <laughs> <laughs> they don't want us. Yo, it's, it's for the shirt. So today's show is dedicated to the shirt and Don Lewis. There you go. I should have pulled it out of my drawer, but I don't want to start nothing on there. But and, uh, no, no, no. Yeah, it was good. I was hoping. I was like, well, I'll get her to wear it one day because my friend, um, one of my friends had asked where did she get it from. She needed one. Um, it was Cheryl from the Club Funk and Tears. So I said, well, I'll text Nancy and let her know. You know, so I told yeah. her, you know, look you up on Facebook. Right. Well, I posted the link on um, one of the posts that you did, but that particular shirt is available at rookieatl.com. Oh, that's rookieatl.com. Their merchandise is fabulous. Um, yeah. Yeah, I love that that shirt. I, that's my shirt. That's my go-to. And this is another one. This one is from lolanit.com, and it says, keep your praise, black women, one hour wage. How about that? There you go. Say that again. <laughs> Could you say that again keep for me? Your, keep your praise. Black women want our wage. Pay us, baby. You know what? That's a good way to start. So let's start right there. Um, I, I need people to understand that might not know. What is the purpose of the fraternity with the pearls and the purple and the chucks? A lot of people don't know what that's about. Well, that was basically um, a, a unity movement, if you will, um, on behalf of the Panhellenic Greeks. You know, um, Kamala Harris is an AKA. Um, and, you know, the first elected black woman VP, 
you know, shout out to her. Um, but what the Greek women did this time, which is something beautiful, is the fact that they got together. It didn't matter whether you were AKA, if you were a Delta, if you were a Zeta, um, they just got together and determined that they, you know, in honor of this accomplishment, they were going to wear their pearls and their colors and their chucks um, in honor of Kamala and what she has done. So that's what that was all about. You know, that was so cool to see um, her up there along with, you know, President Biden. And at least I, I know for, I, I don't know. And you can answer this for me when I when I kind of got into the whole week because it was a whole two months of just stuff, man. You know, and I, I ain't going into that negative negativity stuff, but everybody knows what it is. And when I saw the 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 love and the hope, the word I use is hope that came back. Um, I kind of felt, OK, this is the first part of the healing process. Did you mm -hmm. feel that way? Yeah. Once once the fog kind of lifted and you were able to see it, you know, it's definitely a thing of hope. But with that hope comes responsibility. So if, yes. if you think back to when President Obama got elected, it was that same feeling of euphoria and, you know, hope and everything. But we kind of got lazy. Yeah, we, we did. Didn't, we did. We as a community, didn't do the work that was necessary to maintain that. You know, we got caught up in the emotion of the moment, but we didn't do the work. So this time, I hope, you know, I think we're more woke. With, with everything that we've been through, <laughs> if we're not woke now, <laughs> I don't know yeah. when or what will wake us up. But, you know, with the euphoria, you know, and I'm not taking away from anybody celebrating or anything like that, but there's work to be done. We have to do the yeah. work. You know, yes. we have to yes. do the work. As I stated, you know, the first time we got together um, on the show, I had made the statement that nobody's coming to save us. We have to save ourselves, you know, and that's where the work comes in. She's in a great position. And that puts us in position, but we can't just be in position and just stand there and, you know, yeah, wait for yeah. the, the savior to crack the sky and save us. We got to do the work. And yep, that's yep. I agree with you. Yeah. yeah, I agree with you. And and we're going to talk a little bit about doing that work today because I love that phrase. Um, and again, here we are hanging out with the lovely Nancy Marie. Um, you know, she's a beautiful activist, um, spiritualist, you know, writer entertainer, um, you know, and, and does so many great things for her community. Um, and, and when you say <clears throat> do the work, I love that phrase um, because I feel like you, a lot of us got complacent, you know, and a lot of us did not want to understand we got to put in our elbow grease on this thing, you know, and I was just talking to um, some gentlemen yesterday, a couple of gentlemen, you know, I pick them up here and there, whatever, on my job. And I was like, you know, I'm so sick of black people complaining about things that we can fix ourselves. You know, as Afro-Americans and minorities, some things are out of our control. But the things that are in our control, we don't have an excuse anymore. Like you just said, if we ain't woke now, when are we going to be awake? Um, right. Do you think our young black men and women will take the torch that we're trying to pass, those of us in the light, and really, really run hard with it? If we pass it. Right. If we if pass, we pass it. it. Because the mindset with a lot of people in our generation is that these no good, such and such and so and so, they ain't going to be nothing, they ain't going to do nothing, instead of taking that energy and investing it in a way to show them, hey, there's another way. There's something out here for you to do. You have a purpose. You know, we got lazy. It, it, you know, it got to a point where we forgot all about community and it became all about us. And the mindset pretty much was, look, as long as I'm straight, you know, I'm straight. You know, don't you know, I don't really care about the next generation or whatever. But, you know, that's kind of like warped in itself, because at some point, 
you're going to have to depend on the next generation to take care of you. You know, if you spend any amount of time on this earth, you know, their your life is going to be in their hands at some point. So yep. why not Amen. make an investment in them that's going to yield you a return that you're going to want to deal with? Yep, that's right. And, you know, you, you couldn't have said it better because as we the elders, I consider us the elders and Kevin and I, and you and I talk about this all the time. Now that we've moved into that elder position, we do have to pass the torch. We do have to encourage. Now is not the time to try to break anyone down, specifically if they're trying to do something good. Now is the time to lift up. And again, I'm talking about our community. Um, you know, we have to work together with everyone. But like Malcolm said, we do have to focus our energy and thoughts on our community. And I know that's one of the things that you're doing because you have a podcast or you, you, you know, you run a podcast about with some young women that are doing some great things. We talked about this last time. Can you refresh yep. us on that a little bit? Oh, I sure can. Cause 21, 2021 started off with a bang for those girls. We've been on hiatus uh, since October and 2021, we picked up the UK in our listening audience. Um, Melbourne, Australia came on and uh, they ranked twice on Apple Podcast uh, United States nonprofit charts. When they first came in, they were at number 65 and then they jumped to number 17. Like I said, we haven't released a wow. new episode since October. Um, wow. and, and trust and believe the new episodes that are coming up, we have this one young lady that's breaking down the autism spectrum and how it impacts the African-American community. You would think that you were speaking to a 65 year old doctor with the wealth of knowledge that this young lady has. It's 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 amazing. Her name is Marmia Day. Watch out for her. Wow. But to answer your question. Girl, no, 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 no. Good. Go, go with it. Go with it. Well, you know, because you asked me to refresh the audience as to what the podcast was about. So I am on the board of directors with a nonprofit in Philadelphia called the Evelor House. Some of you may have um, seen a special on NBC on November 25th, uh, L'Oreal Women of Worth. Our executive director, Cheryl Ann Wadlington, was nominated as one of the Women of Worth. So NBC did a special on all of the nonprofits that got nominated this year. And I made a special guest appearance as myself on NBC television. So that was kind of dope. Um, so the Evelyn House is a nonprofit organization that serves um, teen girls of color here in the Philadelphia region. And now with the uh, pandemic, we've actually managed to go nationwide because we had to move our um, programming to a virtual platform. So that enabled us to serve girls throughout the United States for the first time in our history. We've been in operation for 16 years. Uh, the Girl Truth, What Lens Are You Looking Through podcast is um, a part of the Evelor House. What happened was we did a um, on the table Philly discussion a couple of years back and we brought in some of our graduates and asked them, you know, what were the things that the Evelor House could be doing for the girls that we weren't doing. And their response to us unanimously was no, the Evelor House did everything that they were supposed to do for us. It's time for us to step up and do something for our community. And the podcast was yeah. one of the things that they wanted to do. So Without getting into the weeds, you know, as I told the whole story last time, um, I took the responsibility of serving as an advisor um, on the podcast and ended up becoming the producer. Um, so for our first uh, two seasons, I am the producer. I did bring on an associate producer at the request. One of our, our former hosts um, mm -hmm. decided that she wanted to get more into the production aspect. So I've been actually grooming her. So hopefully by season three, she will be the producer and I will just be the overseer watching them do their things. But they talk about, you know, issues that are, you know, affecting them, that are important to them. They tell their stories. Um, they create narratives and they are just an amazing bunch of young women who are very in tune to what is going on in society as far as racism, sexism. Um, you know, the issues that are impacting them. 
Uh, some of our episodes included Blacks Against the Black Lives Matter movement. That was a, <laughs> whoo, that was a mind blowing episode. Um, yeah. Black Girl Pain was another good one. Um, they, they just, I learned something new from them every time they record. I learned something new and, and I'm daggone near 60 years old. Okay. Tell the truth. Shame the devil. I learned something from those girls every time I listen. Yeah. You know, it's so good to hear those stories because I, 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 I cross paths and I told you I live across the street from Duke university. I live 10 minutes away from NC central, right? Historical black college. And I live 15 minutes away, 20 minutes away from UNC. So I am constantly picking the brains of these young people, black, white, gay, straight, it don't matter. I want that information. And like you, I learned so much from talking to young people because I think what happens as a parent, you notice your parent, and as, as the elders, sometimes we get jaded about the feelings of our young people and about the um, stress and emotion they're under. And I remember... We told, I remembered this. You told me this, right? And that's why I'm bringing it back. Yep. Yeah, I remember so that one episode, right. man. They were talking about stress, and that Layla, boy, Layla. I mean, she socked it to me because she was talking about she was talking about something else, and she just stopped midstream, and she was like, "Yeah, you know, because you parents, you know." We, we come to you without stress. And, you know, that ain't stress. You know, like, well, it's stress yeah. to us. And I mean, I was so convicted because I, I can yeah. count for fingers, toes, Kevin's fingers and toes, and, you know, all of my children's fingers and toes, the number of times that my children have presented to me that, you know, they were stressed out about a grade or about a this or about it. And I'm like, oh, that ain't really stress. But, yeah, it's stress to them. You know yeah, where yeah. they are. Yes, it's stress, and it impacts yep. them. So yeah, she, Layla, got me good. I was like, man, I had to put up the church finger and like excuse myself because. Right. Yeah. Yep. I mean, one point though, she was on point. Yep. I, and that's why I brought it up because I went back and looked at at my notes because I script and I take notes and I'm very detailed, right? And even though it seems like I'm chaotic, my chaos is my organization, and um. I said, okay, I wanted to bring this up because it stuck with me. Ever since yeah. you told me that story, I have been a gentler, kindler dad in that aspect because wow. I understood it was just something I needed to hear. And I really, I was always like that, but I just needed that reinforcement. That's why I brought it up because I think it's a very good point. For you parents out there, again, here we are hanging out with Nancy Marie. Um, for you parents out there, are you about to be parents or uncles, aunts? I know Mark got nieces and nephews. We have to remember the same way we feel about what's going on now, our children and our younger people feel. So on another note, as we as we get into 2021, I know you got a few projects. You got your hands and stuff. Um, I know you're going to be shooting a new Naphead Funk Army video whenever our budget comes through, which I'm praying for that. So, yeah, I, we got we, that's a done deal. That's that's already been signed, sealed and delivered. So we're trying to just get the paper right for that. But, you know, that's we're working on that. But with, with your new project, and I know you've done KHS, KHX, you know, the base roads groove stuff, right? But I know you were working on this thing, the shine box, the shoe shine box, right? Yeah. And that's, that title is very powerful. It's, it's extremely powerful. All the thoughts that go around that. So tell us a little bit about the shoe shine box. So the Shoe Shine Box is a musical play or play with music by a young lady here in Philadelphia by the name of Adrian Cater. And it the central piece, everything revolves around this shoe shine box that was owned by, you know, the grandfather and passed on down through the generation. So it's actually a journey from the 1940s to present day, which really illustrates how things have changed and how they really have not changed. And like I said, the, the main character, if you will, is this shoe shine box. So I was hired as a, a top liner. And the, for those who don't know what top lining is, is I was brought on to 
write the melody and the lyrics and to do the vocal arrangements for the musical pieces in the uh, play. So I got to do a, a nice 1930s, 40s piece um, in, entitled Colored Lines, Blues for Jackie. Um, so it, it pretty much details the life story of Jackie Robinson um, from the very beginning to the end of his life, um, you know, where initially it was just telling him, you know, kind of behave yourself, you know, hush up, Jackie, don't say nothing, run those bases, ignore their faces, you know, all the stuff that he had to go through. So we, you, you know, we have that part of it. Um, uh, then we go to that middle ground where he started having trouble with, with people of his own race, you know, people saying that he didn't deserve to be where he was, that there were other people better than him that deserved the position that he got. And then finally we get to the end of his life where we just tell him, you know what, ignore their faces, say what you got to say, don't be quiet, you know, so it, it's it's a really great because it makes references to the lynchings that were going on and the danger of being black during that time period, which really has not changed in this time period. You know, um, so it, it's the journey, you know, it's the journey. So it relates to his life, but it also relates to what we're going through. Then the next song, which I co-wrote with Adrian, deals with a young man coming home from the Vietnam War. So, you know, much of the same stuff going on in that particular piece. And then, you right, know, we, right. all, it, it, I mean, it's, it's an amazing, amazing play. And then it also deals with the plight of black women. So there was one song um, where there's a 16 year old boy who really, you know, his mother gave him away practically at birth and he never really understood or knew the reason why. And, you know, for most women in that predicament who make that choice to give give their offspring away, it's usually looked at in a negative aspect. And this particular song, she has passed away. He doesn't know she's passed away. So she's coming to him in the spirit to explain to him that, you know, this was really a selfless act. She would have preferred to keep him, but all she had to give him was the life that she gave him when she birthed him. She had nothing else left to give. So it was better for him that she gave him away so that he at least could have a better chance at life, you know? So it just, you know, it lays all that stuff out. You know, it breaks a lot of the stereotypes that we think about when women make this choice to, you know, give their child away. It's not always because they're trifling and, you know, they selfish and all this other stuff. There's, you know, a lot of stuff, you know, a lot of backstory that people don't really take into account when they look at situations from the surface level. And that's always, that's always been my goal for people to stop just looking at the surface, you know, I like to go deep and, and you know, kind of explain the reason why so that, you know, we can get along better. We can understand each other. We don't always have to agree, but if you, you can understand why I did some of the things I did, you know, yeah. that might not have been your choice, but that that's what was good for me at that moment in time. You know, of course, yeah. we grow, we develop, we mature. And so at this stage in life, maybe I could make a different decision. But where I was at that point in life, that was the best that I could do. And I did what yeah. I had to do to survive and to make sure that you survive. So if I, yeah. I'm, I'm excited about this piece. Yeah. You know, that's that's such a beautiful thing. And there was a lot. Um you know, going on in that shoe shine box that you just brought to light. Because a lot of times kids do grow up, and I know, um, you know, firsthand, you're always thinking in the back of your head, what did I do wrong? And then as you get older, um, people with wisdom can tell you what you just mentioned. Maybe it wasn't something you did. Maybe the person that, that had to put you in a better situation did it for the greater good. You know what I mean? And sometimes we can't see the greater good. God lets us, he unfolds certain things to us certain ways. You know, everybody can't always get it from the pulpit. Sometimes you got to get it from however you get it. And what, right. but the main thing is you get it. 
that that's my thing. I don't care how you get it, as long as you get it. And and um, I'm glad you mentioned that because for a lot of people out there that's watching, you know, don't don't hold a lot of things onto yourself if you were in that particular situation. Because like Nancy just mentioned so eloquently, it could be because it was better in the long run than the short term. Sometimes as a parent, you got to think ahead down the line as opposed to like what's right up front. I'm very excited about the shoe shine box because I used to have my dad's shoe shine box for the longest, See? right? And that was a Sunday See? morning ritual. Saturday night or Sunday morning, you get up, you get you get everything, but you got to do the, the shoe shining first so you don't get your clothes messy. So you right. take care of all of that before you get dressed. But I remember it was such a powerful thing to open up his shoe shine box, had a little mirror on it, then it had, you know, the, the Murray's, right? And, then it, and I remember it had all the little stuff that you need because one thing we used to take pride in is looking good, you know? Yeah. We didn't have the sagging yeah. pants. We didn't have the dresses up to our navels. We, and I'm not saying anything is, is wrong with that per se, but then there is something wrong with it when you're not in the right situation. And that bothers me. I always, 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 that's one of my pet peeves. I hate the sagging pants. And I tell some of these young men, listen, you know, our ancestors, got dressed on Sundays because that was the only day they could actually be out of the fields and look good and feel good about themselves. It was self-esteem. Mm -hmm. You know, you get as sharp as you can, the ladies with the hats, like your hat you was rocking, right? Everybody. And, and that tradition, we need to keep doing that. You know, there are certain things that, yes, we don't need to worry about. But certain things, I'm very – and I got a closet full of suits. i just not in a position to wear them a lot. I'm not a suit wearer. I'm a T-shirt, jeans kind of guy. But I still have them because I know there may be certain times when I have to make that appearance and I have to look mm -hmm. a certain way. Um, so, yeah, it was it's cool, um, you know, that sometimes um, – I'm getting this comments. I was just looking over to the side of your comments. And again, thank you guys for hanging out with Nancy Marie. Um, you know, she's a great social activist, writer, arranger, producer, videographer, overseer. She's on, you know, the board of directors for her podcast, overseeing that. She's a mentor. This woman is completely off the charts. Um, the shoe shine person was a vital part of the Renaissance. I have seen some great shoe shine guys here in North Carolina. Mark Lee said that because he understands he understands the the, the, yeah. the importance. Um, but so as we move forward, tell us when that's going to be out and where people can find that play. Well, it ju we just went into rehearsals uh, this month. You know, due to the pandemic, everything is kind of up in the air. So as they move forward and move along and things are finalized, I will be sure to let you guys know. Um, yes, yes, Because yes. I know they're going to do the debut here in Philadelphia, and I believe the hope is to take it on the road. So I will definitely. Yeah, that would be on. beautiful. Yeah. And, and just so you know, my producer, Mark Lee, is on the board of directors down here at the Carolina Theater, also the Haytai Center, the Black Cultural Arts African Theater down here in North Carolina. So if you come right. here, I know you got a home. I know you got a home because I know Mark can take All care right. of you. So, and again, yeah, I know he'll hook you up. Um, and again, thank you, Mark, my man behind the glass, my producer and everything for chiming in. I appreciate you, bro. Um, so as you started to get your visions to write, the songs and produce where did you get your inspiration from to do the the production and the actual work on the shoeshine box so you know adrian like i said she already had the music we um she's been working with bryant Pugh, who is a phenomenal talent here in philadelphia um so she kind of and and i mean i've been doing this since i was i would say 13 maybe no even younger than that, because uh, my sister that I told you about in the other um, episode, she would be, you know, a, you know, composing her music in the music room at our house. And I would be in some other room like six years old, like writing music. I mean, writing lyrics to what she was composing. So it's, it's always been something that I did. Then when I got older, like it's around 13 or 14 or whatever, and I started, you know, becoming parts of bands, you know, in the Queens uh, circuit, 
you know, we would be sitting down in rehearsal and the guys would just start jamming or whatever. And I'm sitting there listening. And, you know, next thing you know, we have, you know, hey, I wrote something to what y'all were playing. And, and we, you know, record it. Um, right. And then it, right. moved, it moved into a thing where, you know, people would, you know, bring me in, tell me what they want. And then I'd kind of just like meditate on that and, you know, and bring that whole thing. So with the Jackie Robinson piece, you know, Adrian was like, you know, I want a, a 1940s, 30s, 40s type of feel. And I would like a reference to Jackie Robinson if possible. And so as I'm listening to the music, you know, I started hearing that chant, you know, hush up, Jackie, don't say nothing. Run those bases, ignore their faces, you know. So I started thinking about it. Wow. I was like, okay, so wow. why? Why can't that whole thing be about Jackie Robinson? And so that's when I formulated in mind, you know, take it from that point where they're telling him to shut up, don't do nothing, you know, just, you know, kind of be that quiet Negro and yes, yes, or no, sir, don't, you know, to kind of keep the peace or whatever. And then, you know, you move into that phase where, you know, can you make it home? Well, you're not sure if you can trust your own, you know, and then move into the thing where, you know, like, Screw yeah, all of you. Yeah. Say what you gotta say. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So yeah. I usually you know, so I can do it either way. You can give me an idea and you know I'll incubate your idea and then bring it to life. Or if you just give me the music and let me flow, you know, I you know, I'm open to working either way. Yeah, that's a beautiful gift, man. And I love the dichotomy of the play on words. You know what I'm saying? Can you make it home? play, you know, home, home. And it's so right. cool to hear that because I hear your cotton clubbish thing going on at the cotton right. club and how you, I hear it, you know, so that's got to be gotta a beautiful hear, Man, you got to hear the music. Oh my God, oh, that God. song is so, it's just, I get chills, you know, when I heard the track, I was just like, oh my God, you know, I was like, whoa. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's that's amazing. I love to talk about things like this. Um, you know, and what we're gonna do right now, I gotta take like a, a quick 30 second break. You stay on. Um, you know, I just okay. gotta run a few, you know, spots on my sponsors. We're hanging out with the lovely Nancy Marie. Um, you know, Mark's gonna put you to the side. I gotta run a few spots and give a few shout outs to the people that actually support this show. Um, and I know KHX bass jams and your entertainment company is one of them. So we're hanging out with Nancy Marie. Um, you know, we're gonna run a spot right now while we um, you know, just mentioned P Funk Radio. I love you guys, Keith Jackson. You guys are amazing. Thank you. Philly Phil down in Texas, get on the funk bus. Thank you for always supporting the show. Um Afterglow, 92416. Um, I appreciate you, Donna Sneed, Benevolent Funk. I appreciate you, Otis Hawk. Thank you so much. Bootsy and Peppermint Patty, thank you for always supporting the show. Um, and, you know, also, I can't forget, um, and, and I want to make sure uh, that you guys know, Tony Cam hasn't got back to me yet, but he's going to be sending me some merchandise. Um, so I'm going to be, you know, wearing his stuff as well. And we're going to make sure that, Anybody that wants to support this show, you send me something, I'll make sure. And a much big shout out to my main man, Dr. Brooklyn Stein. Get your Bootsilla Rockstar wine at QueenCityWines.com. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Boosty Council, don't forget. Get your wine. Get your wine on. Get your funk on. Hanging out with Nancy Marie on the other side of the glass. Man, shouts out to my main man, Dr. Brooklyn Stein. Thank you for keeping Nappy Head tight and all your good comments and your love. And I love your Facebook Live, Dr. Brooklyn Stein. Also, shout out to my main man, my funk master, my brother from another mother, Mr. Mark Lee behind the glass. I was told by a very good, very good source that, Mark, you have one of the greatest radio voices in the history of voices. I ain't going to tell you who said it because I don't want to blow your head up but thank you mark okay so nancy <laughs> you know i gotta get one in on mark because he's gonna give you later i gotta get it now i was told mark like <laughs> i was told i heard you got the greatest voice and i'm like well dang i'm doing the show though i heard 
All right, we're hanging out. Fun from the front seat. Thank all you guys for tuning in. Here we are, nine on the grind TV. I've been blessed to finally get my network up and running. I'm very happy about that. We're going to be doing some great things. Going to have a lot of good stuff popping for Black History Month. We're working on that now. We already got the whole month booked full of shows. So you guys stay tuned, stay up, stay with us, stay on the grind, nine on the grind TV. Funk from the front seat. Nancy, the importance of creativity in the aftermath. Um, that, yes, that's why we saved this segment for the last half hour. This is important. We're going to break this down. Just the phrase, the importance of creativity in the aftermath. Um, could you give us a little insight on that particular phrase? I definitely will. Um, you know, we as artists, you know, we have a purpose in the earth. And so you think about the last four years, and especially this last year, 2020, being everything that it was to, you know, all of us. Um, and the fact that we made it through and we're still here, right? We survived the aftermath. There are so many of us, you know, artists that are now ancestors. They're no longer here, but we're still here. So in this aftermath, in this period that comes after so much trauma, so much pain, so much turmoil and uprising, it's what, what are we going to do with this time? You know, as an artist, it's our responsibility to create what we've been placed on the earth to create. I firmly believe, you know, we are made in the image and the likeness of God. God is a creator. So that Amen. means we are creators and we are placed on this earth to create. I'd like to like just read a quote real quick um, yes, from yes. this book. Um, it says, all of us carry within ourselves something that is waiting for the right moment when it can burst out and repair the particular separation that we are experiencing. Amen. And that's Maladoma Patrice Somme from the Healing Wisdom of Africa. Okay, so definitely right now, um, if you look at any traumatic experience in history, Every period that has the trauma that we've experienced in 2020, there's always been a renaissance. There's always been a, an outburst of creativity, if you will. Um, and it's, it's necessary for the healing. It's necessary to repair the breach. So again, think of all of the dynamic artists that have left the earth during this period and the fact that we're still here we're yeah. still here because there's something left in us that we need to contribute to the earth do our part to repair the breach and to heal our people again nobody's coming to save us we have to save ourselves so it's yes. of the utmost importance you know whether it's coming out of pain if it's coming out of trauma whatever it's coming out of you have to take that thing that you just went through. You know, think about a woman who's in birth and think about all that pain, all that struggle, all that suffering, all that screaming, all that hollering. I just want it out. I just want it out. And I don't care how many times you say, I just want it out. It's not going to come out until it's time for it to come out. So you have to prevail. You have to go through that pain. But trust and believe when that baby is born, Every ounce of that pain that you felt, you know, it, it's, it's a memory, but you don't remember the intensity. You just remember, yeah, I went through this thing and look what it gave me. Look what was yeah. birth. So even with our creative stuff and, and God knows, God knows my life. I have sent you to track our worship. Yes. You know, for yes. one particular reason. You wouldn't believe half the stuff that I've been through. And that's another that's another story for another show, another day. But I have really had many traumatic experiences in my life, um, starting from when I was a child. And um, my bishop, Bishop Gilbert Coleman, Jr., 
at one point in my life when I mean my life was really low, he said to me, said, at these times in your life are the times that you should be the most creative. And if I was like, what, really? And right, then as right, I, right, right, right. As, yeah, as I thought about it, I was like, like oh, okay. And so in that travailing moment, I wrote that song because I'll, you know, called I'll Worship. Like, although I do not have all the things money can buy, I'll worship. And though I suffer loss and like a mourning dove cry, I will still offer you sweet sacrifices of praise. You're still worthy of all my praise. I will worship and rejoice always. Lord, you are worthy of all my praise. When we released that song, I used to right. do the praise and worship team at Freedom Christian Bible Fellowship. Mm -hmm. There was such there was such a healing, such a deliverance, such you know an anointing. And I was like, so you mean all this that I went through to birth this song to bless the people, heal the breach? There you yeah. go. Yeah, yeah. So other um, people, yeah. Yeah. So it's 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 like. It doesn't matter what you went through or what you're going through, and it's not even about you. And I think that was that was the hardest lesson for me for me to learn because yes. I take everything I take everything to heart. I wear my feelings on my sleeve. I get easily offended. It's like it's not about Same. you, boo. It's not Same. about you, right? <laughs> it is not Same. about you because trustably, everything you go through, it's not for you. It's for somebody else. Because you're going to yep, make it yep. through and then you want to, you know, be able to reach back your hand and, and pull them up out of the same thing that yep. you just came through. It's funny you say that because two quick things and I'm going to let you get back to that point. David Brooks says, hallelujah. Hi, Nancy. Good to see you. So David <laughs> Brooks is watching. Brooks. And, 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 and thank, <laughs> thank God we have good people in our lives that make us aware. Because my best friend and my brother, one of my, I got a lot of them, said, Lo, yo, bro, it ain't always about you, right? Because I would call him and I would get on the phone and start being moaning, being moaning about me. And he's like, yo, hold up. Hold up. Say hello first. It ain't about you. So I like it when my friends tell me honesty because my friends know I'm like you. I wear it on my sleeve. It may pierce me, but it's only going to make me closer to you because I tell you I love you and I appreciate you telling me things like that. Second of all, when you said I'm um, praying, I know there's a and I love Prince. You know, I'm a huge Prince fan. Um, and, and there was a line in one of his songs and he says, sacred is the prayer that acts for nothing. You know, and I always keep that in the back of my mind. Yes, he one of his songs. I forgot what song it is. Um, you know, but he, he says, "Sacred is the prayer that asks for nothing." You know, in that princey kind of way, right? And I thought about that one line, so powerful. You know, because he was talking about a mother who had nothing, and she prayed and asked for nothing for herself. You know, kind of like what you just mentioned. I just wanted to throw that in there. But getting back to the aftermath. Um, I love how you're you're gonna we're gonna help heal people today on this show right here on Funk on the Front Seat, not on the Grind TV. Ms. Nancy Marie is spitting out words of wisdom. Um, you guys can always go back and watch all my shows. We're on Twitter, we're on um, you know, all the social media outlets, you know, Facebook, YouTube, Periscope, whatever, whatever. You can go back and get this information because it's very important you understand what this woman is saying right now. Um, yeah, David Brooks says that song is called The Love We Make. So that's the song. If you look up the love we make and then you hear that line in that song. Thank you, Brooks. I love you. So, Nancy, the, the, let's not get to the aftermath at the moment. Let's get to, OK, we went through it mm -hmm. and now people need concrete roadmaps. They need GPSs and YouTubes to navigate. And I'm using that as a metaphor to navigate this thing that we call life in 2021. Give us a few tips on how to navigate the dark that we're, we're trying to walk our way out of? Well, for me, it's, I've learned that it's, it's personal, you okay. know, so I can, I can tell you what I do and what works for me, but what I'm finding out and e even in that time of discovering how to make it through, um, mm -hmm. I've, I've learned that, you know, Okay, let, let me back it up and let me put it to you this way, right? Got it. Coming right. up in, in, in the church, if you will, 
Um, you know, we, you always hear the phrase, you know, your personal relationship with God, your personal Amen. relationship with God. However, the, the, the dichotomy, if you will, is totally against that. It's like if your relationship with God doesn't look like the blueprint that's established by whatever place of worship that you go to, then according to them, you don't have a relationship. But yet right. still, you're telling me, you telling me your relationship has to be personal. But then you're giving me, you're telling me that it, if it don't look like this, then it ain't a relationship. Right. We, yep. that, that mold, that has to be destroyed. Every night Thank in my you. prayer time, every day in my prayer time, one of my prayers to the Lord is just, you know, destroy religion. So we can enter into relationship with you. You are too big. You are too ginormous, if you will, for for us to even, you know, believe that there's only one way to get to you. Yep, you know, yep, yep, yep. God, you know, man looks at the outward appearance. God's looking at the heart. You know what I'm saying? So it's like it's personal. So if it, if in fact it is personal, then let's make it personal. You have to spend yep. time with with your creator for yourself. You have to discover what his plan is for your life and you have to be unashamed and unafraid to live the way that he's created you to live because it's probably going to go against the norm. It's probably going to offend some people. It's probably going to get you called anything but a child of God, but that's where you have to be established rooted, grounded, and know, hey, this is between me and my creator, you know, and when you approach it from that standpoint, it makes you uh, available to be open to accept other people wherever they are, you know, yep. it, and, and that's important. That's what's going to bridge that gap, you know, when like minds and like are just because we don't agree on the principle, whatever, like-mindedness and like our heartedness, hearts full of love, hearts that want to see a better community, a better day, a better, you know, that's when we can come together and make that change and do the work. You know, yep, it's, yep, it's, yep. it's amazing now. You, you see, you see Muslims and Christians coming together with Buddhists and, you know, it's like that's the religion is becoming less and less important. That's and it's right. more about it's more about the relationship. And that's what God yep, yep. God wants. He wants relationship. He wants us to talk to him. You know, I will never forget. And, you know, people think I'm crazy and that's fine. They can think that all they want. But <laughs> I was in my bathroom one day, you know, and this was this was back in had to be in the 90s. And I was going through some stuff. And at this point, I, I pinpoint the 90s because this is when I was in my super religious, oh, holier than thou, Father God, and, you know, blah, 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 whatever. So I'm praying like that in the bathroom. And I swear for God, I hear this voice says, shut up. <laughs> shut up. And it stunned me because there was nobody in the bathroom but me. Right, right, right. right. Voice says, Boy says, shut up. They probably said, now talk to me like you're talking to your friend. Yep. Changed my life. Yep. yep. Changed my life. Because a lot yep. of what I was doing was just repeating behaviors that I had seen. The ritual, and, yes. And, and thinking that made me spiritual. And it didn't. Yeah. It didn't. Yep. You know, it, you know it was, it's funny it was, you say that. No, no, go ahead. I was just going to say, it's, it's funny you say that because I used to tell people that and they used to laugh at me. I, I told people like back in the 90s when I was recovering from my drug addiction, right? And, you know, um, I was able to get through that, thank God. And I used to tell people, they like, well, your father was a minister and you should be this and that and the other. I was like, listen, I don't really like religion. And that was blasphemy. You know, I was playing in the gospel yeah. band, a couple of them playing all over the place but the thing was i used to tell people listen i do this for the joy and for the spirit and i love the music i said that's how i get mine i said like, but i don't like religion and they would say why and i was like because number one i see four churches sitting on this block in brooklyn 
And I still see people sitting on the steps that have no money and no food. When I come out of church, I have to give them some of what I made. I said, I never understood how we can divide ourselves because of the one common goal, which is the power of the one, the creator. If we're all supposed to be walking to that tip, why do we need barriers and fences, Methodist, Catholic, and Christian, Episcopalian, and this and that and the other? I get it. I'm not knocking any of those. I'm telling everybody right now, don't misconstrue what I'm saying. Please understand, I love you for all the things that you do out there and every religion you're involved in. It doesn't work for me. I, too, heard that voice when I was listening to Larry Graham. I had got so low in my life, and, and, and I always used to put on music, and, and I literally had drugs in my hand looking in the mirror, and I was playing this song, Mirror, by Larry Graham. Here in my mirror, you know, and he was very spiritual about his thing. And I looked in the mirror, and I literally saw what Satan looks like. I saw him. He was half this side. This side was me, but this side was the dark. And I was like, is that what I look like to people? Now, I wouldn't have, I didn't hear that in church. All the churches I was playing in, I heard that in my basement apartment when I was getting ready to do something I shouldn't have been doing, and he personally spoke to me. That's why the story you just said, it related me to that. I was looking in the mirror. Somehow, he likes to speak to us through mirrors. I don't get it, but he does. right? And, and I heard the song, and it was so powerful, I started crying. And from right. that day on, I did not have that craving for that drug. It just, like that. It was just because right. what he did, he wanted to shake me and wake me up and say, listen, I can let you go, but I got work for you to do. You know what I'm saying? And I, and I felt it, and, and I was like, damn. You know, and what I did, I just gave all the stuff I had away. I had like four or $500 worth of stuff. I gave it away. I was like, listen, I'm done. I cut my crowd loose, and I moved from Long Island to Staten Island where I didn't know anybody. That was my stand. That's, I'm testifying right here. People that know me know this to be true. They said, what happened to Zach? I called him. I'm like, yo, I'm in Staten Island. That's how I met Kevin and everybody because I, I was all alone. I left. And, yeah. and I'm telling you this because this is so powerful. This is such a great show. We're hanging out with Nancy Marie, Nine on the Grind TV, Funk from the Front Seat, because we're spitting out some knowledge that everybody needs to hear. And, and as we get into this next phase, Nancy, of, okay, we went through the aftermath. You gave us some tips about the personal relationship, right? Now we have that practicality. Going forward, um, if someone, if you were going to talk to a young person or anybody that has a creative idea, right, how would you let them or give them insight as to how to go about physically making it a tangible, monetized thing? Well, you have to do the work. Um, and again, that too, that journey is personal as well. You know, for some, it would look like going to school and getting a degree. I don't necessarily, you know, recommend that. It's good for some, but not necessarily good for, you know, right. I have the pedigrees or whatever, and I still had to go through the mazes to get, you know, where I am, if you will. Um, so could I have done everything that I did without the degree? I totally believe I could have. Uh, yeah. Could have saved a lot, you know, of money, if you will, even though I did have scholarships and everything, um, there was still a bill that was, you know, my responsibility. So, you know, it could have, could have been different, but you can go and, you know, cause let's say you're a filmmaker, you're interested in filmmaking. You can go volunteer, be a PA, you know, work on sets and learn as much, if not more, as yeah. going through an institution to get that yep. degree. Now, where the pedigree yep. comes in, you know, into play and where, where that's important, you know, if you desire to teach or, you know, if you need that paper for what you're going to do, you know, becoming artistic, you don't necessarily need the paper. It's, it's good to have. And if that's your role, then by all means, go for it. But that's not the only way. I went back to my alma mater, um, High School of Performing Arts, and I did a couple of workshops there. And in one of the workshops that I did for the senior class seminar was I set up these chairs and I called for volunteers from the audience. And I told them, I said, their, their purpose or their goal 
was to get in. Okay, so there was a narrow passageway from where I set the chairs up. I said, your goal, your responsibility is just to get in. And, you know, I gave them a signal to go. And of course, you know what that looked like. All these people trying to fit into that little narrow crevice or whatever. So when I got, I, I stopped it before it got to, you know, before somebody got hurt, we got a lawsuit on our hands. You know, we, okay, let's, all right, now let's, let's uh, look, look at what we just did. I told you your responsibility was to get in and everybody tried to get in through that narrow passageway, right? Did anybody ever consider walking around? Right. Going through the side. There was openings on the side. There were windows. Right. Like, did anybody ever think that there was another way besides this narrow way that you were shown? And so it's the same thing in life. We think that there's only one path to get us to where we have to be or where we want to be, where there are side doors and windows and all of these other ways to get in. And you have to find and determine what that path is for yourself. But you better trust and believe if this is your purpose and this is your destiny, the path that you walk, whichever way, even if you get off path, somehow you want to end up back where you're supposed to be. And you're going to fulfill that purpose and that vision that was ordained specifically for you. It's, it's, it's yeah. no getting around it. It's no getting around it. It's going to happen. Yeah. Yeah, that's very powerful because um, The Veil Has Been Lifted was the title of my very first show last May. And now, um, you know, I'm only like five months away from being a year, you know. And when I first did it on Facebook Live, it was a 15-minute thing. I had talked to Kevin about it. I was like, Kev, I got to do something, man. I don't know what I'm going to do, whatever, whatever, COVID, you know, I'm complaining. You know, so I said, I'm going to start something. I hope it works, you know. So here we are, you know, are. and for those of you out there, um, just keep your mind and keep your mind on the grind, like Nancy just mentioned. And, you know, you can make things happen in a small way. I love the fact that I'm able to speak with you and, and hang out with you. And we got plenty of time because I'm on my own platform now. So ain't no time yes. to switch it. <laughs> so I love the fact that we could do this because um, when we chop it up like this, you know, it's spiritual growth in food. You know, and one thing that you and I have talked about in the past is we're feeding people how to feed people this knowledge, this this experience that you and I have, this relationship um, with the creator that, you know, some of us have that's very powerful. And, and it comes to you in certain times. There was um, a book, um, Chicken Soup for the Afro-American Soul, or, or I believe that's the title. I'm not sure. Correct me. Um, tell us soul. a little bit about. Oh, yes. Tell us a little bit about some of the things that's involved in that book and where people might be able to find that because I find those chicken soup books to be very, very helpful. I got a few of them myself. You know what I mean? So I, I find yeah. them to be very, very um, insightful, you know? So tell us a little bit about that. So I actually joined Chicken Soup for the Soul series, which is the longest running anthology and literary history according to the guinness world book of records and i came Woo! on board in yeah yeah 2004 was my first title again came, it came out of trauma came out of trauma um the the way i i connected with chicken soup again another story for another day but i joined them in 2004 with the award-winning title, Chicken Soup for the African American Soul, which was the Black Book Award winner for nonfiction in 2004, um, joined forces with Lisa Nichols and Tom Joyner, who were the co-authors on that series. And this book was the, it was the first time in the history of the anthology that they did a title specific to any culture. And it was yes. groundbreaking. It was groundbreaking yes. because you know we we got to do um, a book tour where I got to go all over the United States telling my story, um, and that led to Ch Chicken Soup for the African American Woman Soul, um, in which I had two stories, and I was also the special project manager under Lisa Nichols. Um, but I, you know, I bring I bring that particular title up. Because, again, there were the two stories. One of the stories was my happy story, if you will, which was called It Was Magic. And it talked about the time that my dad 
took me to see um, Hello, the all black version of Hello Dolly on Broadway. <laughs> Cab, Cab Calloway, um, right. uh, 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 Morgan Freeman, and yeah. Pearl Bailey, right? So it, you know, it was a magical moment. So at, so at the end of the, at the end of the play, my dad being who he was, Lord have mercy. And I, I, was, I, was like, I was five or six at the time of when this happened, okay? He lists me, because we had front row seats. My dad wasn't no joke. <laughs> he was an engineer for the Navy. And um, so he put, put me up on the stage and told me to go say hello to Pearl Bailey. Right, I, right. I, what, you know, and, and so, but, you know, it was daddy, so... Of course, I'm daddy's girl. I'm not going to do anything, break his heart. I'm going to do what he said. I was, I was petrified. So here I go walking across the stage, and all you can hear, ooh, ah, all, the audience is going crazy, right? And so I finally walk, got past Morgan Freeman, Cab Calloway, and I get to Pearl Bailey, and I just tug her, tugged her dress. And she looked down. She's like, where did you come from? And I pointed to my father and said, over there. And the audience went ballistic. She picked me up. <laughs> she put me on the forehead. My sister has the nap where they placed the napkin on my head that has her lip prints um, from where she kissed me on the forehead. So that story was in the book. But then there was another story in the book that I wrote that was called You'll Do It For Me. Um, and again, I, I'm very open with my life. I, you know, I don't hide much. Um, yep. So this particular this particular story dealt with a period in my life where I had been accused of child abuse and was facing 25 years in federal prison. Okay, um, so yeah, it, it it was a deep situation. So this particular story dealt with um, when I got locked, the first time when I got locked up and I was, <laughs> I was in the cell, right, with this other girl and they took that girl out and then this other girl came back and no disrespect, but she was bigger in stature than you are and talked like Barry White. So needless to say, I'm like, I'm like, oh my God, I'm gonna die in here. I'm gonna die. This woman gonna kill me. I'm gonna die, right? She came in like, where's my, my juice? So clearly they had given them, you know, their little che cheese sandwich and a thing of juice. And they had taken her wherever they took her. It's, I guess the girl that left before she came back must have taken her stuff. And of course she looking at me like I took her like, oh Lord God, I'm gonna die up in this. I'm gonna die in this cell. I'm never gonna see my kids wow. again. Oh Lord, wow. help me, help me know. So I'm sitting there and I hear the spirit say, ask her if she's okay. And I'm like, God, you crazy. If you think I'm saying anything to this woman to think I took her stuff. And he said, it, he said it again, ask her, is she okay? So she had climbed up on the toilet and come to find out that her boyfriend was in the next cell. There was like a little window and they were talking to each other through the window or whatever. So she, when she climbed down off the toilet, I asked, I said, are you okay? And she kind of looked at me. She was like, no, I have special medication that I'm supposed to have. And they won't take me to my house to get my medication. And they don't have it. And da, da, da. So we started talking and, you know, cutting it up or whatever. And, you know, come to find out she was in there, you know, because um, she had a warrant. And the boyfriend had a warrant. So he had dimed her out, so she in turn dimed him out, and they both ended up getting arrested and brought to, to the thing. So, you know, I told her, I said, you know, you just got to, you know, put your trust in God. Everything's going to be okay. Yeah, and she was like, yeah, I know. G's going to work it out, but da, da 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 or whatever. So we talked, we talked, we talked, and, you know, I shared my story with her and why I was there and what had happened. And um, right before they came to get her, she climbed back up on the toilet, and she was like, Babe, I made my decision because she already knew she was going back to D block. You know, it was no question, you know, what her fate was. So she was like, babe, I made my decision. You know, I'm going to stay to myself and I'm going to stay with God. 
And I was like, and the spirit spoke and said, that was the purpose why I brought you here. And I was like, well, great. Can I go home now? <laughs> right, 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 right. Where's the key? <laughs> like, nah, wasn't no going home. So they, they carried me off to this other place. And, the, you know, my lawyer didn't even know where they had moved me to. Again, this part of the story, another story for another day. Well, let's stick to the story in the book. So I had this urge, even with what I was going through, I had this urge to pray for this woman. And so I was praying for her, praying for her. the entire month of January. I just prayed for her, just prayed for her, just prayed for her. Um, and then around right, February 2nd, the burden to pray was just lifted. Like I didn't feel it anymore. It was just like it was gone. I was like, OK, you know, I didn't know what that was about. And my girlfriend had called me. And I, at, the, at this point, I had six including the baby, six of my seven children were born. Um, so I actually had five because they had taken Michael away from me. And um, so my girlfriend called and she said she had tickets for the Universal Circus. Did I want to go? Okay, sure, why not? When I hung up the phone, all I, I can just describe it as this dark cloud just came over me. And I started finding every excuse that I could find not to go to this circus. It, it's, it's too cold to be outside. Nancy, the, the, the tent is heated. Well, I, don't, I don't feel like, needing, you know, every excuse not to go. But I ended up going anyway, full blown attitude, because I, I really, I mean, this depression thing, this darkness, it was just like, yeah. it had me in the grips. And I didn't want to be bothered. I didn't want to be there. But I ended up yeah. going anyway. So we get through the gates and I hear the spirit say, turn around. I turn around and who's standing in my face? Angie, the girl from the cell. Wow. And we hugged, we cried. And I'm like, what? she was like, I don't know what happened. Said, but all of a sudden, February 2nd, they released me. Remember, February 7th was the day I told you that the burden to pray was lifted. Right, right, she right, right. She got released. She got her children back. And she was the only female electrician working on that circus. And wow. so, so now we're sitting, we're sitting down and God speaking to me and said, this is the reason why I brought you here today. I wanted you to see what your prayers did and for you to know that if I did it for her, I'm going to do it for you. So that was the second story in the book. And so while we were on tour, my inclination was always to share the happy story about Pearl Bailey, right? You know, but in my spirit, it was always like, nope. Do do the other story. Do he'll he'll do. And I was like, I don't want to tell that story. I want to tell the happy story, you know. But right, I right, 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 right. Tell the story, and Zach, every single time, two or three people would come up to me like, I needed to hear that. I'm going through the same thing right now. So it was just, it was, yeah. it's you know, it's just amazing, you know, what you can do with your trauma. If if you if you trust God, if you're obedient, if you listen, if you allow yourself to heal, then you'll be able to reach back and heal others. You know that is so. I got goose pimples, and and you know I'm damn near in tears because I'm emotional about that story. Linda Lou says, "Hey, what's up? How you doing?" David Brooks hey. says, "Great story." Sometimes when we share our pain through, you know words, which I call symbols, but through words and stories, uh, we are actually passing on. And, and a lady told me this a long time ago, you know, this lady I met, you know, she says, your ancestors since the beginning are always going to be with you. The stories kind of change, but the meaning and the content is what's important. And she told me, she was a very wise woman, and she told me and this was like a couple of years ago. I was like, man, I'm getting ready to have my eighth, ninth, tenth surgery. I was like, what's up? She said, you have to go through these things because, and I said, well, what's the point? You know, I'm looking for the end game because me, I'm like, hey, what is the end game? And she said, you're going to find that out many when you get to wherever you got to get to in the light. She said, but you got to tell this because you're inspiring other people. And I, I looked at it. And I was like, 
so I got to get all hurt all the time <laughs> to inspire other people. I accept that because the first right. thing I thought about was people that I was in the hospital with, right? And this just happened this past August. I have my last one, number 10, and hopefully this is it. I was walking up and down the halls. We're in COVID, right? This, not this, the August last year. And right. it was only like four of us because they had to keep everybody isolated that was coming out of surgery. So mm -hmm. I was always pretty strong after my surgeries. I get up, I walk around, and I see this guy that I had noticed. He was walking past my room all night. And I wanted to see who this was because he was keeping me awake, right? Because he was dragging that, that pole, that IV pole. Mm. So I asked the brother, I was like, hey, how are you? How you feeling? This and that. You know, he asked, you know, you asked, you know, well, hey, what happened to you? You know, this, I said, hey, another shoulder replacement. What can I tell you? Right? So I asked him, I was like, what's the matter? You know, I said, what happened to you? I said, you look okay physically. I said, but what, what's, what's that? And then I happened to look up at the medicine and I knew right away he had CA, right? So I said, what kind of cancer do you have? You know, and, and, and he told me, you know, he's got incurable pancreatic cancer, you know. Wow. So I thought, I was like, you know what? And we stood right there and said a little prayer, whatever, right? By the nurse's station, the nurses joined in and everything, right? And he said, you know, he said, you're the only person since I've been here that aren't, wasn't afraid to talk to me because I had cancer. He said, everybody else fears that because they feel it's something that they can catch, you know. And we sat down in my room and we talked for like an hour, you know, just about life, you know. And he said, you know what? He said, you really made my day. He said, I'm going to miss you because you get ready to go home today. And I gave him my card. I said, listen, stay in touch with me, whatever. And he said, how did you how do you feel so comfortable? I said, listen, um, you know, I understand. I get it. You know, I said, because. Um, you're still a human being, you know, right. um, and what you're going through is something I'll never, hopefully, I don't know what you're going through. I said, but I wanted to talk to you as a human being to a human being. I'm not afraid of what you may have inside of you. I was worried about your heart. I said, because your heart feels heavy and I'm an empath. So I felt it. I said, all night long, you was walking up and down the hall. I said, your heart was so heavy, brother. I said, I, I, I wanted to just let you know I care about you. I love you. You know, and, and he said, I made his day. And when I left, you know, I closed the door and he was standing by the window waving at me, you know. And, and I was like, man, I got on the elevator and I was like, dang, you know, here I am worried about an apparatus. And this man has a major organ, you know. And again, you always get signs about how to help and, and what your purpose is, you know. Um, and, and I love that story. And I love the fact that, you, you know, you're a published author and, and, you know, you went and told that because, you know, we can't have the light without the dark, can't have the sun without the rain. So sometimes we need to see these other things. And this ties into the aftermath. Now that we see clearly what some of us have already known, the people that are going to be in the dark and that are bitter. I had somebody yesterday, the other day, they were so bitter, and I texted them back on Facebook. I was like, yo, why are you so bitter? I didn't do anything to you. You know, this is, I'm just a human being in this country trying to live. And he texts F this, F that, and F you, and cursing me out, right? Yeah. Didn't know me from Adam. He's cursing me out. And I texted him back something kind, and I said, you know what? I'm going to love you. If I see you hurt, I'm going to love you. You know, I said, Jesus is love. And then I didn't hear no more from him. And then a minister commented on my comment, this minister from Long Island and Jeff Robeson, too. And they said, yeah. And he said, man, he said, I love the way you handle that. I said, yo, bro, I, I ain't in this whole fight and the hate thing anymore. I was like, hey, I can't change them. How do you feel about um, not changing or not wasting that energy now that we used to waste on the negativity, even though we got to help them? I want to do it through just an example. How are you doing it? Right. That's all you can do. You got to set an example because all this going back and forth, all this trying to prove your point, prove that you're right. It's not even about that. It's like, you know, we're supposed to be living epistles. Right. So just set the example, you know, be open. Like, you know, even when you walk in a way, and you fall short, you know, because that's going to happen too. you know, 
Yep, One yep. thing that God has been pressing on my spirit is like that I need to be gentle with myself because yeah. I'll screw up and then I'll, I'll spend the next, you know, 30 days beating myself up over the screw Same. up, wasting yeah. valuable time instead of just yeah. like, OK, you know what? Yeah, I, I messed up. OK, let it go and let's let's keep it moving. It, it's we got to drop this extra baggage. We got to drop this guilt. We got to drop this self condemnation and just like walk the walk, you know, and allow people to see us as we really are, because that's what's going to make the change. They see yes. us doing the work unbothered by our shenanigans, you know, forget theirs, you know, because that don't belong to us. But, you know, we unbothered by our shenanigans. We unbothered by our mistakes. We're unbothered by our hiccups. We keep it moving. And they'll be like, OK, what is it that this that you have? I, You know, I want some of that. And I tell you, baby, you already got it. It's inside of you. The kingdom is yep. in you. You just got to manifest yep. it. You have to manifest it. Do your work. That's right. That's right. That's right. You know, Chrissy Key Rollins was on my show and she's a regular and she said the exact same thing. You know, she's very cool. And, you know, she's a woman that I stay in touch with down here. And she she's very spiritual in that aspect, just like you and I. And she said the exact same thing. It's almost like we get it. And we, we've been through some stuff, you know, fire and forged into iron, steel hard, you know, just mm. And, and she said, you know, you can't beat yourself up because we're flawed. You yeah. know, spiritual beings in the physical body, we are flawed. And I love the fact that you said that because people in the audience, again, here we are with Nancy Marie, Funk from the front seat. I love the fact that you said that because we do carry truckloads, trailer tractor truckloads full of stuff. That's mm -hmm. unnecessary going forward because it has no bearing on, on what we're trying to do as our mission. And right. you're right. Sometimes it does weigh us down. Um, when we look, when we look going forward and we're going to circle back to what supposedly they're going to do as far as um, change, what are some of the main things that you think if you, you were sitting down right now with Kamala and Biden, and they said, Nancy, give us one thing that we can tangibly do right now to help the people. Not what they say, but what do you, if they asked you, what would, can they do? What would be one of the things that you might mention to them? Wow. I know. I know. It's deep. I know. Dang. Ah. Uh. So many I things, mean, right? It's so many things. Like, where, where do you start? Like, where do you start? It, it's such it's such a mess. Where do you even begin? You know, of course, I mean, the, the first thought, of course, would be the monetary aspect. But then you have to question, would that be the best thing at this time? And I say that because... There's an educational process that needs to take place in our community where we understand what we need to be doing with that funding so that we don't find ourselves in this position any longer. You know, of course, you know, for some of us, if, if we were to get those stimulus payments and, and they were becoming regular, how many of us would, would, would even be thinking about, OK, let's invest this. Let's let's pay off some of this debt. Let's make some investments. It it would more so go to like feeding that need of buying stuff so that we can temporarily feel better about what's going on. And all that would do is just create greater obstacles down the road because that's not where the actual need is. The actual need is is for us to become financially literate to know that even if we just have five dollars, if we do the right thing with that five dollars, it could lead to us having five billion. But we got to do the right thing. We can't plant the seed in any old kind of soil and expect a return. Right. So yeah, if we're taking right. that money and we're, and we're investing it in the materialistic, 
then those things pass away. But if we're investing in lineage and legacy, if we want to make sure that our great grandchildren don't have to worry about a student loan or a house because we've already made the investments to make sure that each of them have $25,000, you know, when they graduate and they have a home because we built we paid for it for them and it's there waiting for them. You know, it's so it's like we got to get our minds right before we can even sit down with Kamala and um Biden and ask them for anything. Because, because I love, like, no, right I love now, it. I love it. Yeah, I love it because I'll tell you why, because that was my thought process. I was like, OK, um, I don't need to have a line 5000 miles long at the chicken place. Because that's what happened down here the last time. I could tell when the stimulus checks came in. Because you notice, and this is just me on my conspiracy tip. A lot of this stuff always happens around elections, around a big sporting event. Um, mm -hmm. When we had the primaries down here two years ago, it was the same day that they announced the Popeye's chicken sandwich. <laughs> Nobody else saw this. So that I'm in the car and I'm like... <laughs> Yo, it was, it was, and I never ate it, and I refused to eat it, and I'll tell you, you're right, because I said, wow, I'm going to vote. I was like, I'm so glad to see so many people out voting. When I got up closer, I realized I'm turning one way, they're turning in to get the sandwich, and I'm like, the sandwich? Yep. And then I was taking a lady, because I, I volunteered to drive people back and forth to vote. So the lady said what I said. She's in the back seat, middle-aged lady. And she said, wow, I'm so glad to see so many people voting. We got up there. I'm getting ready to drop her off. And she said what I said. She said, I could have made this in my kitchen. She said, this line should be over here for the voting. That's by plan. That's a plan. I don't care what people say. And Linda Lou says, this is such a good show. Great message. Um, hi, Linda Lou. Um, I love you. Dr. Brookenstein's watching. Hi, Whoever's Linda. watching. We love you guys. Yeah. So, so, right? So, I said, this is not by accident. And it was only in the black communities. Because that's the only place those places are. Baby you know what I'm you. saying? <laughs> that sandwich. That sandwich. I, I... Sandwich. I love it. Sandwich. sandwich. <laughs> it was like, it was like. Like I never had crap, but I, I would assume that that's, that's the, the experience because I had one, and I was like, one time after that, I was in the line, and the people was in there fighting, and and I was like, you know, I can't do this, and I really, I literally, I had to, I had to detox, I I had to like get it out of my system. It was like I was chosen for this stupid behind sandwich, and then like. I, I had one recently, you know, because ain't no lines no more. It's like COVID done shut all of that down. And it's not even the sandwich. It's not the same. So I don't know what they was putting in the first version, but it's 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 different now. It's not even the same. So uh, I told people, I said, beware um, of the Greeks bearing gifts. And it always happens around a major sporting event, around around election day and everything else. And I said, this is by design. They don't want people to focus on things. I was cracking up. And to, to, I'm not saying I'm a perfect angel, but I refuse to eat the sandwich because I saw so many people eat it. I said, I am not going to eat this Baby. sandwich. And I love Popeye. I, 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 I hate the sandwich. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. I love it. Linda Lou says, yes, always wanted to do stuff election time. You're right, Linda, including arrest for petty crap to get the um our votes down. Yep. 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 That's right. That's right. You know what's funny too? It's like it's like when we talk about this and people, you know, like Linda and David, people chime in, whatever, right? It really makes for the show. And I encourage everybody out there, if you're watching this show, Funk from the Front Seat, Nine on the Grind TV, please be interactive with us because this is how we learn. This is how we share experiences. I'm so great to have you on my show, Linda. I'm going to bring in, um, I'm, you know, um, Mr. Mark Lee, my producer, and also well-known activist here in North Carolina, because I know Mark has a few um, points that he wants to ask you, Nancy Marie, because he always does, and I appreciate Mark's opinion, um, as well as your voice. 
So come on in, Mr. Markley, with the greatest radio voice. <laughs> It's always great popping in and everything. As y'all were talking, I was really enjoying the conversation and all of that. It was an amazing conversation, by the way, and I was really uh, checking out what y'all were saying. One of the things that I was thinking about, Nancy Marie, is how a lot of times we are too stuck on uh, thinking that we are actually in control. And there are a lot of things that we are not in control of. Like we cannot control other people's attitudes, their thoughts, and things of that nature. And I know that if a young man and even now at this age and everything and I'm pushing up near 60 getting around close to that age and everything that there are times when I think that I am in control of things that I have no control over I cannot control what somebody else's mindset is and their attitude is and things of that nature so even in relationships whether that were relationships when I was in my 20s and 30s or even later life relationships there are times that we think that we are in control and we actually have to understand that there are things outside of our control including some things that we have have absolutely no control over because the man up high or the woman up high is actually is probably is is actually in charge of what's going on and they are in charge of what's happening in that sense but i do think that a lot of times we are thinking that we're in control of a, a lot of things that we have no control over including like even time and things of that nature and i remember even in relationships thinking that i could control this or that and then i had to come to a great understanding that there are things that we do not have control of, and that's just some of our growing up and being impasse and all of that. So I was just uh, wondering your thoughts on that comment that I made about us thinking that we're in control of things that we have no control of. I'm so guilty. I mean, I, that's something that I'm still working on. But God, early in life, yeah, it, it, ew, I'm guilty as charged. And the lesson that I'm I've learned and am learning to implement is the fact that the only thing that you really can control is your response to whatever is thrown at you. You can't change anybody. You can change yourself. So a lot of stuff that used to be outward, like, yeah, I can control this. Now I'm turning that inward. How do I control my response? How do I control my emotions? You know, because outside of that, there's like really nothing you can do. You want to be throwing some some boots and some shoes. And like, how are you going to respond to that? Because until you learn to respond the proper way, if you will, you're going to continue to run up against that obstacle until you learn that you're not going to be able to prevent that shoe from being thrown. But what you can control is your response. So that's what I've been working on. Because That's right. Whole, David Brooks says, if if you don't like the effects, don't produce the cause. You know, great from the Dallas George. Christmas. That's right. If you don't like the effects, don't produce the cause. I was working on Yo, something that the other like day. Yo, it is. It's a Funkadelic song, but I can we can do it again. Trust me, because I was working on. I was reading Jeremiah, right, and, and Jehovah, and and I was the other day. And I even told Mark this. I came up with this phrase, and it's like. You know, you can't believe your way into a, your the behavior. You can't believe your way out of the way you behaved your way into it. You know, and that's kind of the premise of it. You can't, you know, believe your way out of something you behaved your way into. You know, and you're right. And you know what? I'm going to add that to the set if you don't like the effects. Because that is a deep song. Bernie Worrell and, the, um, you know, they used to do it, the Woo Warriors, when Andy was playing with them. So, but yeah, that, that goes way back to... Um, us being in control of our own community, taking it back to the top of the show, Nancy, worrying about how we can make our dollars work mm -hmm. for our communities. And Mark is very big on this as well down here in North Carolina. He's a, you know, knows all the politicians and everything. And Mark, I can honestly tell people out there watching, Mark is one of the biggest um, quiet advocates down here in North Carolina. Um, you know, he, he, you know, you ask Mark about any history. North Carolina actually had a black Wall Street down here that people didn't even really know about, you know, um, and we get ready to get out of here in another minute or two. But, Mark, I want to give you a parting comment. And then, Nancy, I'm going to give you a parting comment, um, you know, and David Brooks says the situation is just that it has no special power to do you harm. It's your reaction that counts. Brooks knows that Funkin' Nelly. He'd be quoting it. Dr. Yeah. Yeah, but, yeah, Mark, he... if you if you have one final question for Nancy, um, what would it be? 
Oh, well, I'd love to hear her just, and I know it's a long-winded conversation. That's but okay. We good. We were talking about the uh, renaissance, and I'm actually of the opinion that we're in the middle of a new renaissance right now. I'm a big fan, as Zach knows, of the Harlem Renaissance and all of that. So I was wondering your thoughts, if you think that we are in the middle of a new renaissance, and if so, what you think some of the results of that will be, because I'm actually of the opinion that we're seeing a great development in our artistic community throughout the minority community, but I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. I absolutely agree. We're we're at the beginning of what should turn out to be one of the greatest uh, Renaissance periods that we've ever known. And the beauty of this Renaissance is that it spans the generations. You know, um, I don't know if you guys are familiar with this artist named No Name. No? No, All right. Heard. You oh, this young lady, her name is her her name, the her artist name is No Name. And she has this one particular song um called Diddy Bop. This is from her first project. The first time I listened to this, I was transported to my stoop in St. Albans, Queens, when I was 10 years old. And it was it was just an, an amazing experience. Uh, just And you guys need to listen to the song to understand where I'm I coming from. I just wrote it from. down. But, yeah. but the, amazing, the amazing thing about it was that I was looking at the comments on YouTube and there were people from every generation, her generation to ours to, to older, that had the same experience listening to this song that I did. You know, I'm talking, you know, people who are in, in their 20s now, people who are in their 70s. This particular song transported them back to a time when they were 10 years old, sitting on a stoop somewhere. And I'm, this, this young lady, the, the power and the transcendence that comes out of her material. And she, you know, when her first project was released, she actually did a project with, oh God, what is, what is, uh, Ch- Chance the Rapper. She did yeah, a guest yeah. on one of his um, projects before she released her first solo project. And reading up on her, she was coming from a place of death and depression and suicide and drug addiction. And I mean, you know, the very stuff that we were talking about at the top of the show, she managed to take that and create a phenomenal. I mean, I'm talking, you know, and I I hate comparing artists with each other. But if you could imagine the the rebirth of Lauren Hill. Oh, well. This this young lady. Yeah. Yeah. And and she's like, she's so under the radar, like people need to know this woman and know the music. She's released several other projects since that initial project. Um, And and of course, the more recent ones, they're a little more. um, They're they're not as raw as the original. The music is still good, but she uses a lot of uh, more pop samples and things like that. Whereas in the yeah. beginning, it was more raw, more, you know, earthy or whatever. But it's still good nonetheless. Um, yeah. So you you have people like that. And then, you know, you have the old heads like us. And like I said at the beginning of the show, if we're still here, it's because we have a deposit to make. Yeah. And this, yes, this is right. a time, it's, it's, it's a time of community. Mm-hmm. It's a time of coming together, you know, like we, we all have to gather on this 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 uh, killing ground and, and sow these seeds and sow them together because the crops are too important. And my crop may not be for you, but what right. you have could be for somebody else. But the p- importance is we have to plant them together so they can grow together so that we can collectively be blessed because the time of the individual is up. It's over. It's about the collective. It's about community. And we have to get yep. back to that. So that's what this renaissance is about. It's about the rebirth of the collective, of the community, of the because that's where the power is when we stand together. That's right. Oh, yeah. That's what's up. Yo, Mark, thanks for that. Um, could you bring up that picture for me now? 
Yeah, definitely. Um, thank and, you. Thank uh, you. Appreciate uh, that. Get ready to bring up that picture of that legend and everything. And um, just one quick thing I was going to add to that really quick is I just saw that we lost another legend as well. And as I was, uh, you were doing the show, I saw that we lost Larry King, which you know is that great, powerful. Oh, my God. Show. So he just uh, passed away as well. But I'm going to bring up the oh, picture wow. you were referring wow. to. But, yes, we lost the legendary Larry King. And speaking of community, he was one that definitely did a lot of interviews that shared community and all of that. So. Definitely wanted to honor him as thank well. Thank you, thank you for saying that because that's deep. Because Larry King, he he's the man. It's just it's Larry King and then everybody else. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah, man, that's deep. Thank you for saying that. Here we are hanging out. Uh, Mark Lee, great producer, director of this show. I love you, Mark. Thank you, Nancy Marie, author, activist. Um, you know, she sits on the board of directors. You know, playwright. Um, you know, just all the great things that you you do, Nancy, is just an amazing. Um, journey that you're adding to this canvas of life, and I appreciate that. Um, Nancy, when you look at this picture, what do you think about? I just think about the struggle. You know, it's like with all the talent, with all the abilities we have, with all the greatness, you know, things like racism and sexism and and intersectionality is just like the things that are designed to hold us back and hold us down and yet we still show up we still shine we still smile you know we're still here um i'm actually tearing up this yeah it's powerful right it's a powerful image yeah uh, i wanted to show this because yeah i i wanted to you know i didn't forget about this but I wanted to save it for the end of the show because I wanted that very response from not necessarily you, but from my audience. Because despite death threats, despite having to have security, despite death threats to his kids and family over a game, despite being one of the first to break the color barrier, coming from the Negro Leagues to the Major Leagues, despite playing in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and then the dirty South Atlanta, Georgia, despite all of that, and he was from Macon, I believe, uh, or Columbus, Alabama, wherever, but despite all of that, still we rise. Now, because Babe Ruth was white, he was a great baseball player, don't get me wrong, but Josh Gibson was a better home run hitter, and then eventually God sends this man, right? He sends this man with elegance, grace, he took the torch from Jackie, like we talked about earlier. That's why it's, it's ironic how this works, because we was talking about the shoe shine box and Jackie Robinson, you know. Mm -hmm. So uh, to pay tribute to Hank Aaron, um, you know, to take that torch from the shoe shine box and run with it like he did. And he never really broke out and hit 60, 70, 80 home runs in a season. He was consistently averaged at 40. He tap out of 40. And then about three-thirds of the way there, or uh, I'm sorry, two-thirds of the way there, people realize, whoa, he's actually going to do it. You know what I mean? And, and I remember as a kid, my father, listening on the radio, because what happened is this game was played because they set it up to where he was going to do this for the home crowd. He was playing the game earlier two days earlier, on the road, and he tied the record, right? He tied the record. Then they didn't play him. The coach said, no, we're going to wait and get you home and play. The, end, the, the Major League Baseball said, do not let him play until he gets home. Mm. It was a Monday night, which is rare for baseball. They broke in on NBC. They didn't cover baseball like that on a Monday night. They showed the game. My father never, he used to like baseball. We'd watch it on TV together. But for some reason, he was doing something and he was listening on the radio. So I went where he was. He might have been working on a car and I'm leaning over as a little kid, you know, 1974. I'll never forget it, April 8th, right? And, and he's listening and he says, this is important. He says, I'm going to listen to this game. He says, I want you to watch and listen. He said, this is going to be so important. And he said, for our people. And at the time, it didn't hit me. You know, because I was young, and I'm like, okay, it's a baseball game, whatever. But then I realized my father was saying, 
he endured, which was the lesson. The home run was secondary. And then when he hit it in the fourth inning, my father stopped what he was doing, right? And he, he, he went and sat in his bedroom. And I never seen my father cry. Mm. And, and he, 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 he had emotion. So I said, Dad, what's the matter, you know? And he said, I remember in the Negro Leagues, you know, seeing these guys come through. Because my father played in the Negro Leagues. People don't even know that. He was a first baseman and a catcher. Yeah, in Georgia. He was a first baseman and a catcher. And, and he had such a feeling of joy because this man, had endured. It wasn't the home run. It wasn't the record. It was the fact that my father said, I'm glad he lived long enough to do this, you know. And at that moment, I understood how powerful race was, you know, and the effect it had, you know, on people such as my father. And people forget Hank Aaron, without the 700 and something, some home runs, he still had over 3,000 hits. If you take out the home runs, this is how great this man was, all under duress. And that's right. my thought on that photo. I'm going right. to give you one parting shot. Nancy, let, take it away wherever you want to take it. You can talk about the picture, talk about whatever, um, you know, and then we're going to get on up out of here. Nancy Marie, I love you. Great, great, great show. You, um, for those of you watching on Facebook, thank you for commenting. I love all you guys out there. We're going to rerun this show again later on today on the watch party because it's that powerful. Um, Nancy, your parting thoughts. Man, just rise up, come together, find your purpose, fulfill your purpose, and let's build this community so that we can heal from all of this trauma that we've experienced and bless the earth with what we were put here to bless it with. That's that's all we can do. Yeah, that's yeah, I agree. I agree. And to get back on our last thought, you know, he was born in Mobile, Alabama, and he also became a civil rights activist later on in his life. Um, so thank you, Henry Hank Aaron, and um, to Larry King, and to everybody else that lost somebody in their family, know that we love you. Um, if you have a birthday or anything out there, know that we care about you, and we want the best things for you. I'm going to get on out of here with my roll call, man, so you can hang out with us if you want. You know how we come in hot and we go out hot. So this is what we do. Funk from the front seat, 9 on the Grind TV, every Saturday right here, 12 p.m. i like to thank all the people that support the show. And I want everybody to get up. If you're home, get up wherever you are and put your hands together. To get out of the front seat, we coming in hot, going out hot. Keep your head up. Lift it up. Couldn't get out, couldn't get through without my monsters, y'all. <laughs> Produced by Mr. Kevin Harrington, by the way. Musical Revolution. New York, where you at? D.C., you're in the house. Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, Ohio, y'all. Minneapolis. Tennessee, you're the only 10 I see. Utah, Las Vegas, yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me put on my sunglasses so I can see what I'm doing. Texas out there, y'all. Alabama, shout out to Mobile. Yeah, yeah. California, yeah. West Coast. Next week's special guest, Miss Linda Scheider. Clap your hands. Come on. Australia down under. Love you, Carmen. Love you, Wendy. Germany. Sally Soul, Sister Steady Crew. Speed Funk Radio. Billy Phil, get on the funk bus. Robin Denson, Circle of Peace. Yeah, it's Gon Gonzalez, y'all. Larry Function Jones. Shout out to all the club funkers here, ambassadors. What's up, Brenda? 
tip my hat to Camilla, Joe Biden. Canada, you in the house. You why over in India, y'all. We go around the world with this song. Song from the front seat. Brought to you by Died on the Grind TV. Got our own thing now, y'all. Look out. They gave us a platform. Woo. Yeah, yeah, don't you know? Are you down with it? 2021. Let's make it work. Let's do it. You're the most powerful thing under the sun. As always, peace, love, and harmony. This is your host, number nine. I'm out. The book of life, y'all.